All right, well, now we switch to our question and answer time. I have some questions because I want some clarity on a couple of things. Um, Don, you mentioned um, offense and persecution. What is so offensive about a Christian and the way they operate in the world that the world wants to go to the point of physically harming or providing some way to make their life more difficult? Great question. First Corinthians one eighteen: the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but then to us who are saved is the power of God. Uh, first of all, First Corinthians two fourteen: the natural man receives not the things of the spirit of God, neither can he know them, for they are foolishness unto him, because they are spiritually discerned. First of all, an individual, an unsaved individual, cannot lock in to what we are talking about in and of himself. Obviously, the spirit of God needs to impact the thinking of an unsaved individual. I mean, to suggest that the second person of the triune Godhead came to this earth and was born as a babe in a manger in Bethlehem, lived for some 33 years, died on a cruel wooden cross, and that somehow God is going to accept that as a substitute as a substitute payment for the sins of lost humanity. You know, for the unsaved, it's, I understand it's a, it's a little bit uh, hard to come to grips with, but apart from that, apart from that, David, I mean, to tell an unsaved individual that they are utterly depraved, I mean, I have a hard time telling people that their breath is, uh, is bad. I mean, to tell an unsaved individual they're utterly depraved, they're on their way to the lake of fire, that Jesus is the only way, I mean, they're going to resist that. Uh, they're going to resist that. So there are a number of reasons why unsaved individuals would be antagonistic towards what we are about. First of all, they don't understand. And second of all, what they do understand, they do not like. They don't understand. And second of all, what they do understand, they find offensive. You're telling me that your religion is the only way? I mean, what about these wonderful, sincere people like, you know, the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses? I mean, they're very, very good people. Uh, and you're telling me Jesus is the only way? Let me tell you, you're a bigot. That's what you are. You're an absolute bigot. Uh, so, uh, first of all, they don't understand. And second of all, they're irritated. They're irritated that we are telling them things that does not, do not sit well with them. And as a result, uh, animosity, especially your steeped right? I mean, Paul is going into Jewish synagogues during his missionary journeys and saying that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the law. Crying Romans 10, for Christ is the end of the law for everyone to believe. Jesus is the fulfill, everything in, the old, in your Old Testament scriptures points to Messiah and he has come. And he is the answer. He is the answer for you. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, if, if you could provide a little more clarity on uh, enduring, because I think enduring can sometimes be this like preposterous, throw it up in the air thing. What are the actual thoughts and actions of a person who endures in and out of persecution? And if you could distinguish between the in persecution being delivered you know, enduring while you might be delivered in persecution and enduring while you might be delivered out of persecution. What does that look like practically? You know, we, we shouldn't be sadomasochists. Uh, nobody likes suffering. Remember when the great R.C. Sproul was nearing the end of his life uh, uh, and people was ta were talking to him about his physical challenges. He said, you know, I'm not afraid to die, but I don't like pain. I'm not afraid to die, but I do not like pain. Nobody likes pain. And so there's nothing wrong with when we find ourselves in difficult circumstances, persecution or other difficult circumstances, there's nothing wrong. Lord, please deliver me. Please deliver me. Uh, this is not a pleasant experience. You know, interesting, Paul said in Philippians 3.10 that I might know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings. Isn't that interesting? It almost, that verse almost indicates that Paul was a sadomasochist. 
he wanted to suffer? No, he didn't want to suffer. He only wanted to suffer if that would advance the cause of Christ. And that's what he was saying there. I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings if that's going to advance the cause of Christ. But Paul wasn't the sadomasochist again. He talks here about how the Lord delivered him. He was grateful. He was grateful that the Lord delivered him. So the Lord very often delivers out of difficult circumstances. And we shouldn't hesitate to ask him to do that. But very often he'll not deliver us out. We're stuck with our set of circumstances. So what do we do then? You know, this is easier said than done. This is easier said than done. Um, we understand that God's grace is indeed sufficient. And we keep on, we hang in there with joy because we're reflecting upon the fact that God is pleased and God will reward. God is pleased and God will reward. And this is, you know, Paul said, for a light affliction, which is but for a moment. You know, what we are going through now is temporary. Our light affliction, in the tail end of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are unseen are eternal, 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 8. It's but for a moment. It's but for, how many of you remember Herman Munster? Herman Munster. The, I used to love the Munsters. Bam, ba -da, bam, ba. Do you remember the Munsters? I used to love the Munsters. Anyway, he was, if I'm not mistaken, he was talking to his daughter about life, the gravity of life. And he says, it's like a blink. It's like a blink. That's what it is. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment. Believer, hang in there. You got the grace to do it. And one day, when all of our labors and trials are o'er, and we shall stand on a beautiful shore, just to be near the dear Lord I adore, will through the ages be glory for me. Oh, that will be glory for me, glory for me, glory for me, when by his grace I shall look on his face. That will be glory, be glory for me. Now, look, that's easier said than done for all of us. Are you kidding? Sometimes, holy, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about my problems, man. I'm thinking about my, how in the world, why would the Lord, uh-uh. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving that your request be. Lord, I don't get it. I just don't. I don't get it. But you are perfect. You never make a mistake. So I thank you. And lavish on me grace. You know, God has promised the grace to endure, but there's nothing wrong with asking for additional grace. God, lavish on me grace. Lavish it on me. Lavish me. Just pour it on to aid me in my set of circumstances. Yeah, following up on that, uh, I just have a question. One thing that I wanted just to understand a little more because I, I don't think I understood clearly enough. You talked about investing in your future rewards or in yourself for future rewards in heaven. Could you clarify what you mean there and how that helps endure? Yeah, pastor or uh, uh, the Lord Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19 and 20, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt. You know, you either get it now or get it later. I mean, if you want the big home on the lake now and the brand new car every three months, uh, and you live for that, uh, if that's your priority, 
then come eternity at the judgment seat of Christ, uh, you're, you're going to get very little. Um, but if you, you, you want to have a long-term perspective, uh, you don't want to have a horizontal perspective. You want to have a, you want to have long term. Okay, so eternal rewards last forever. They who turn many to righteousness, Daniel twelve three, shall shine as the stars forever, and ever, and ever. They last forever. So I can reflect upon building up for myself treasures on earth. And depending on my age, the average person lives to about 80, okay? So, you know, I have another 40 years, 30 years, 20 years, whatever, to do that. And then come eternity, and for billions of years, I'll have very little in the way of eternal reward. Or you can invest in yourself for all eternity. You can say, no, I'm not going to live for the here and now because this is temporary. I'm going to live for Christ store up for myself treasures in heaven. I'm going to witness. I'm going to share the good news of the gospel. I'm going to be involved in Christian service. I'm going to pray. I'm going to read the word of God. Whatever money I make, I'm going to turn it over to the Lord. Lord, this is yours, and my priority is you and the advancement of your kingdom, so I want to utilize this money for your glory. That's what it means to invest in yourself for all the... You can invest in yourself for the here and now, or you can invest in yourself for all eternity, and that's what you want to do. Yeah, thank you for that. I see that as the perfect complement to a response to the prosperity gospel. So that's extremely helpful. Well, thank you guys. That was our Q 